Good afternoon. Welcome to the um, Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Lecture Series. This is uh, sponsored by Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, uh, fondly known as OBSSR, and that's where I work. I'm Patty Mabry. Um, I'm here to introduce to you a panel today. And before we get to that, I want to make sure we take care of a few little business items. One is um, Jessica DeBakey at the back of the room. Um, she's someone who you saw on the way in, hopefully, and stopped at the desk. She's a summer intern working in our office. And she has for you um, bi biographies on all of the speakers. So please stop by and get a bio on the speakers, because I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that Jessica has is she's the keeper of the parking uh, stickers. So if you have parked here today, you can get parking validation, and Jessica will be happy to help you on the way out. Um, and lastly, we do have a um, happy hour with a cash bar up at the Marriott, um, which is right up the hill, um, Marriott Bethesda North Conference Center. And um, it will be in the, I think the announcement might have said it was in the Meritage rest Restaurant, but I've been corrected. It's actually a bar there called On the Rocks. But it really isn't um, too hard to find if you're wanting to come and meet with our speakers informally afterward. So without further ado, let's get <coughs> started. It's going to be... Um, this is a special mini symposium, so we're going to have um, two hours today with our speakers, including some time for a question and answer. And I'm going to give you just a brief introduction to give you the context for our um, speakers today. These speakers are part of, um, uh, we call it Comp Mod, and we'll get into that. But they're going to be talking to you about their system dy dynamics models that they're working on for obesity policy. And the network they're part of is called Envision. So let's give you what organizationally I'm talking about here. It's a little complicated, but not really that hard. We have something called the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research. And our office is a member, and that's um, part of the National Institutes of Health. The other partners are um, CDC, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and USDA. And I'm sorry, at the bottom of the slide, I don't have the USDA logo yet. I haven't. They are a newer partner, and I haven't gotten the updated logos yet. Um, at any rate, this is what we call NCOR, and what these are is the funders are organized together to do uh, projects that they couldn't do um, alone. Okay, the slides aren't moving. <laughs> well, I'll have to wait for the slide to catch up for some reason. Do you know anything about this, Hajir? No. Okay. What's what's that? Aha, uh -huh. a different advancing button. Thank you. Um, within NCOR, we have something called Envision, and I put the website up there for you if you want to go check it out. Um, and that's what these projects are part of. And they all um, are applying, well, some of them are applying system science methods, and some are using um, traditional s uh, statistical methods uh, to understand the complexity of obesity. Uh, we have within network, within Envision, we have three overlapping networks. Uh, one is called ComNet. The teams you're about to see here today are part of Comp Mod, and there are actually seven teams under Comp Mod, and we're just showing the two that are funded by OBSSR today. Um, and then there are several other teams that are part of the U01 um, networks. These are funded through um, NICHD, NHLBI, and OBSSR. Um, and those are um, include computational and statistical um, models. Some of those teams are part of Comp Mod. That's why we have the overlapping between these different networks. But for your purposes today, I think it's sufficient to know that these teams are part of Envision and Comp Mod, the Comparative Modeling Network. Okay. Not, not advancing. There we go. So the goals of the Comparative Modeling Network, these seven teams, is a greater understanding of the complex ideology of childhood obesity. So what I want to say here is that um, you can read the slide and get the um, benefit of that, but the models allow you to get at um, complex problems. So the reason we have models is those are simplifications of the complexity of the real world problems. And the real world problems are so complex that to model them in their detail would not um, serve us well. So what you're going to see here is models that are going to bring out certain aspects of obesity and um, the problem that we're dealing with to um, shed light on the problem. And also, they will be able to do some virtual testing. 
so that we can look at policies before they're implemented in the real world. A lot of times if you implement in the real world, it takes too long and you just can't do the experiments that you want to do. And that's what they're here to look at is um, implementing policies. But I want to remind you, these are works in progress. Because of the funding mechanisms I showed you, some are funded under UO1s, some are funded by contracts. These two teams are funded by contracts from OBSSR. They're not all on the same time schedule, and all of them are works in progress. So keep that in mind that these are not finished products. They're works in progress. We got the idea to do the comparative modeling network a while ago. We, we um, had seen CISNET, if you all are familiar with the cancer, I think it's um, informatics surveillance um, network. And um, CISNET is a wonderful example of using um, models in a comparative fashion. That was kind of what we wanted to emulate, but then there's reality of how much money we have. And we didn't have that much money and effort, um, money and resources to put into it. So what we've done is we've kind of cobbled together different funding streams and put those um, teams that are already funded in a different manner together so that we could do this comparative modeling. So that's why you're not going to see, like in CISNET, they can put out a single question and have all their groups do the single question. Well, we had all these groups established kind of in a grassroots fa fashion under different funding streams and, so, um, and also for different time periods. So they're, they're not all going to be um, looking quite like the CISNET teams as far as their coordination. But we will be able to get some good um, findings from them. Okay which the teams will tell you about. Okay, I think it's the next slide if I can get to it. <laughs> okay, there we go. There's model profiler is um, a way for these teams, and it's not made public yet, but at some point it will be. And all these teams are cataloging what their models do and how they're built. So you will eventually get to see that. Um, there's going to be synergies and opportunities, which is why we have the network. So we want these teams to work together on some things and to compare and contrast. So for example, the two system dynamics models that you're seeing here today, um, they can be compared on ones at the community level, ones at the national level. You'll see how they um, work together and, and differently. Um, we also have agent-based models that are not part of the teams today, but are part of Comp Mod, and they are looking um, at one is looking at a social network built into it, another one um, doesn't have a social network built into it, just to see how the models, um, what makes a difference um, when, they, when they do the modeling. Uh, I think that's about it that I have for today, and I think that Peter and Hajir will tell you more about the, the ways that these models will work together. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is introduce our um, first, first team. Uh, you're all our team four, right? So team four, team five um, in the network. And um, I'll introduce team four and team five all at once now, and then they will just kind of go seamlessly among each other. I think the order is, of appearance is going to be Alice Ammerman, then Hajir Ramandad, and then Alice Ammerman again to finish up that team four. Then we'll move over to team five, and we'll have Laura Brennan and Peter Hovmond, and then Laura Brennan again. And so you'll notice that these teams are made up of, specifically, we've done this to have a, what we call a modeler, someone who's um, a, what you might call a card-carrying system scientist, somebody who's been trained in the modeling, paired with someone who's a content area expert. So Laura and Alice are our obesity experts, and Peter and Hajir are our modelers. And we've deliberately done this pairing because we believe that we have a lot to offer from the system science methods, but the people who are trained in the methods aren't always trained in the content area and vice versa. So we wanted you to hear not only the modeling aspect, but we want you to hear from the obesity experts themselves and what they feel they're getting out of this modeling experience. So without further ado, Alice, I'd like to introduce you. And you can find the bios again on um, Jessica has them at the table at the front. So come on up. I might need some help with how to do your presentation here. Which one it is? Um, this one. Peter. I mean, Hajir. Okay. And I need to have this. Let's see. I don't know the Mac. Is it? Oh, it's showing up there. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone. We're glad it's not snowing today. Like, <laughs> right. 
since was rescheduled. And that it's a little bit cooler than yesterday. Coming from North Carolina, I understand, though, that you also have had a little break in a heat wave here. So, so um, I'm going to get us started a little bit. Um, we're not all going to talk about the obesity epidemic, and I'm not going to talk very much about it. Just a very quick reminder, and looking in terms of childhood obesity of the trends over time, as I think you all know, that have been going up. Um, there's some hint that maybe in the older age groups we may be leveling out a little bit in terms of um, obesity in the last few years, kind of past this graph. The F is in fat, the Trust for America's Health um, uh, publication just came out, and there's some suggestion of that. But also keeping in mind that, uh, now I'm doing the button thing, um, that there are the disparities that keep um, tracking with this in terms of this is um, uh, girls on the left and, and boys on the right in terms of youth and looking at um, the date, the blue or the earlier date screen are, are later and um, non-Hispanic, white, non-Hispanic, black race, and then Mexican-American. And so in each case with the uh, minority populations, we have a, a bigger increase um, overall. You didn't find the magic there. Um, so, and again, I'm sure you've all seen the CDC maps more than you'd probably want to. Um, we still have the holdout of Colorado here that um, hasn't uh, shifted. We used to call it, call it the blueing of America, those of you who um, may have been at this for a while, because it was all blue colors, but we've had to add all the yellows and oranges as the obesity rates have um, gone up. And looking at the diabetes rates here, you'll see there is quite the, an overlap in terms of the darkest colors. You've sort of lost the key here, but the the darkest orange brown are, are, are the the most uh, the, the highest rates of obesity, and that certainly tends to correspond with the diabetes rates. And if you can't see this, it says remember when we used to have to fatten the kids up first. Uh, there's plenty of cartoons for obesity, and then just a reminder that this relates to adults as well. This, this is after his um, U.S. tour, David. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and then you've probably seen this as well. This is one variant of the socioecologic model, just showing you the kind of the onion layers and the complexity of um, obesity ranging from, you know, we used to focus all of our attention on the individual level factors of kind of energy in, energy out. And I think more and more we're moving what we sometimes call upstream, going up toward, in terms of looking at the behavioral settings, the organizational influences, sectors, policy, social norms. And just another way of looking at that is kind of on the horizontal is um, starting out here, international factors going through national and regional urbanization, social security, media, and culture, then moving through the community, uh, locality, health care, sanitation issues, and then getting uh, more towards leisure time activities, things that we think a little more directly related with uh, behaviors, ultimately looking at, again, the energy in and energy out, and then how that relates to obesity. And there's a lot going on in the area of policy um, with many recommendations, a couple of inst a number of Institute of Medicine um, reports. This one just came out on the far right there. I was on that group, so I'm uh, heavily immersed in the whole notion of policy and early childhood obesity. And then other reports by Robert Wood Johnson. You see quite a collection of collaborators there. And CDC in terms of how to go about tackling obesity, not so much at the individual level, but more upstream in terms of policy and environmental change. Uh, I think there's a combination of <laughs> buttons that you have to hit. Um, okay, so how do we decide what policies to address in terms of obesity? Ultimately, we want to impact BMI. but. For one thing, it's rare that we can measure all the way through from changing a policy to whether it changes BMI. And so that's one thing that uh, learning that modeling can help us in looking at. And there's so many different issues related to this. Uh, I mean, there's uh, the cost of implementation. Um, and does it even get implemented? And, and, you know, do people adhere to the policies that are recommended? And just very simply put, there's the human cost in terms of pushback. And I think certainly now, all that we hear about the nanny state and that sort of thing with the whole political environment, there's tremendous pushback. We in North Carolina try to, to pass a little 
regulation to try to minimize the amount of juice served in um, child care centers and to not serve um, flavored milk. And the headlines were um, North Carolina legislature wants to ban juice and milk from child care centers. <laughs> so it was a little over interpretation, but um, there's clearly. Um, that's something to be considered uh, as we think about policy now. And then there are the resources involved. How do you actually assure implementation? How do you monitor? How do you enforce? Um, so many, many issues between, you know, just passing a policy about obesity doesn't mean that we're actually going to have an impact. And then there's all the interface and, and unintended consequences and other things with other policies. And then does it last, say, across administrations or um, in general? So we picked an example where we found a, a study that had been done looking at competitive foods in schools. And for those of you who don't deal with child nutrition a lot, these are any item that's um, served or sold in school outside the federally reimbursable meal program. That's why it's called competitive, and that is essentially the kid that's competing for the kid's interest in purchasing power. And this is a list. I'm going to come back to this and describe it in a little bit more detail. But the, the paper that we looked at um, did some estimates of what would happen if you removed all these competitive foods, and they came up with an estimate of 160 to 200 calories a day um, being provided by the competitive food. So the, the question then becomes, what happens if we remove this? So just at a very basic level, does that mean they'll eat more of the reimbursable meal because they won't be buying the competitive foods? Will they bring lunch? But then what will be in that lunch? Um, will teachers, this actually has been reported a few times in newspapers, that teachers starting sort of black market candy sales, um, part, sometimes to raise money for good things. The, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so to think this through, and this is really just to kind of push your thinking a little bit, and the kinds of things we have to, to think about when we put together some of these models. Um, the a la carte items, um, if they're um, taken away, does that mean, as I mentioned earlier, that they'll eat more of the reimbursable meals, but then that means that the, um, the money to the school system goes down, or kids may start going off campus if it's an open campus, so the school program won't get the money from that, and then they are more strapped in terms of serving healthier food. Vending machines are always a question. Usually those are run by the principals, we've learned, <laughs> um, and they tend to get the, um, the money from that. But they're often used for good things, school uniform or band uniforms, that kind of thing. But um, there's a resistance to wanting to give that up because it fills in on a lot of gaps for what the school funding is. There's school stores and snack bars. Is that going to change? That may be a place where the sales would boom after you removed it from the cafeteria. There's now, um, there are some um, policies in schools where they're restricting um, parties in individual classrooms to once a month so that you don't have every other day somebody bringing in cupcakes. <laughs> Our school health person told me that she went to one of these and she said it was just an eating orgy. <laughs> but I guess everybody brought every food they could think of for this one a day, so it was a <laughs> big overdose when they didn't have it. Um, and then there's always student rewards. You know, it's been quite common for a long time for, stu for teachers to give out M&Ms, things like that, to try to get kids to, you know, to reward them for the right answer. And, um, you know, what's going to be the pushback there? What are the concerns? Is that going to, you know, affect education in some way? Um, and then there's the whole area of uh, bake sales, um, the fundraisers that schools have traditionally been dependent on in terms of, um, again, filling in for a lot of the kinds of things that, um, that aren't funded. So that's just to give you a taste for that. Oh, now I've jumped ahead. So, Hajir, I'll let you jump in. Thank you very much, Alice. So Alice asked all these hard questions. I'm not going to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> but I, so, so it was a great opportunity for me to get to work with Alice and uh, with Patty and the CompMod team uh, just see very interesting problems and try to apply a little bit of um, what was my background and my expertise in systems sciences to see how we can tackle these hard problems. And uh, it will be, so, so I think between Peter and I, we have taken somewhat different aspects of the problem so you can get a feel for uh, the diversity of types of approaches system sciences can bring into addressing uh, challenging health 
policy problems. So what we have done in this study, and this is an ongoing work, as uh, Patty mentioned, and uh, we are kind of in the middle of it right now, uh, is trying to look at, uh, so kind of break down the problem into pieces and say, okay, let's just look at a core piece, which is what happens if you are changing energy intake and physical activity to a uh, population in terms of their BMI or their weight distribution. Uh, and uh, try to get that core model uh, in place, which is robust, which doesn't need to be uh, estimated uh, again for any new uh, population, sub, uh, population group that we want to study, so that we can basically do uh, study, uh, once we have that core population model, we can have different interventions under different contexts in terms of the population that uh, is uh, target of that intervention, socioeconomic characteristics, and uh, race, ethnicity, uh, gender, and so on. Uh, and then try to come up with reasonably robust estimates of what would be the impact of that intervention on that population. And then you can do it for another uh, subset of interventions and in the, under a different context and get the impacts uh, or some estimate of the impacts from the uh, modeling that is fairly robust based on the best available knowledge. So the goal of this project was trying to get that core population model. And um, the, to, to build something that works like this, that is, uh, un, it, it, it is fairly robust under different um, contexts and for different population groups, we need a model uh, that is reliable under completely new scenarios and under extreme conditions. Because if you only rely on historical data that you have, uh, it is very likely that uh, a, a new intervention will push you out of that historical domain. Uh, and you need a robust model in that sense. Uh, the model needs to be dynamic because we are looking uh, not only at the equilibrium and the state in some unknown future date, but how things change over time. And how things change over time is important both in terms of the, our ability to implement things, because sometimes you need to have some uh, worse before better dynamics. And unless you build the consensus in, in the society that, that that needs to happen, you wouldn't be able to push it uh, forward. And also for just measuring what is the impact you care about the measure over time. Uh, it needs to be fairly case independent, uh, that core model, so that you can apply it for many different interventions in different uh, contexts. And to get uh, a model that has these characteristics, we want some, we, we really, we, we need some model, model characteristics. So the model needs to be mechanism based. It really needs to capture the underlying biological and physical uh, uh, mechanisms that are creating and regulating uh, the uh, body weight and uh, energy balance in the body. Uh, it, these models to be robust usually need to be fairly feedback rich so that they capture different regulating mechanisms, both biological ones and social ones. Uh, it needs to be bottom up uh, so that we don't make some huge aggregation assumptions at the population level. We can kind of build from uh, bottom up what will happen in the population uh, so, and so that we can use the model for different population groups and feed into that different uh, characteristics and see what will uh, happen. Uh, and also we need a model that is empirically validated uh, so that the parameters are well established. Uh, we can convince uh, the community that this is something useful for any kind of policy analysis. So these are the uh, kind of criteria for a useful approach that we have tried to follow in the work. And to give you an overview of the modeling work that we have done. We start with a, a core individual model, which, actu which actually uh, consists of two uh, pieces for uh, childhood and adult uh, energy balance modeling. Uh, the adult model comes from Kevin's work. Uh, Kevin is here himself. And uh, the childhood model comes uh, from Elizabeth Boutte and her, her colleagues. And we have had to make some changes to uh, make it basically fit our work, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about it. And then you basically replicate that core individual model into a core population model, which is replication of multiple individuals. Uh, and uh, we went through estimation of what would be the energy intake and physical activity um, equations for these individuals based on enhanced data, basically by trying to match uh, 
the predictions of the model, the estimations of the model against uh, what was the data in Enhance. Uh, and once we get a fairly uh, robust and uh, reasonable model, then we can go into the uh, policy analysis uh, domain. And that's where we haven't yet really done anything serious, but we have some examples just to give you a feel for where it is going. So the energy um, uh, model for the individual level, as I mentioned, uh, comes from uh, works of Kevin Hall and Elizabeth Boutte and their colleagues. Uh, and the core idea is that you kind of, you can get most of the uh, changes in body weight explained by having two state variables. These boxes are, are state variables. And if you like uh, differential equations, these are your um, X's that uh, your, your state variables, we call them a stocks in system dynamics. Uh, different literatures have different names for them. Levels uh, is another name. And the rate of change in those or those valves going into them and potentially coming out uh, because they could go negative. And so basically you have a fat mass and fat free mass and you're looking at how they change as a result of uh, the excess uh, energy intake versus energy expenditure or shortage of energy intake versus energy in, uh, expenditure. And there is a partitioning function that tells what fraction of the excess energy goes to fat mass and fa what fraction goes to fat free mass. Uh, these are all well established from uh, different studies at the uh, individual level, biological studies uh, that both estimate the partition function uh, and the parameters for uh, how much uh, energy uh, translates into how much fat and uh, some of the, uh, so th those are the core mechanisms. And we also have the energy intake and uh, physical activity that should go into this model to drive the model. And those we estimate from the enhanced data. And I'll talk about a little bit of some of the caveats that are associated with that. There is also the population groups that influence the uh, energy expenditure, uh, as well as the um, age and uh, gender and socioeconomic character. Well, socioeconomic characteristics doesn't influence this part. It influences the energy uh, intake and physical activity. So um, the uh, solid lines are things that are biologically coming from the li literature. The uh, dashed lines are coming from estimation that is done using the uh, NHANES data. Uh, the data, we basically use uh, the uh, continuous NHANES, in the, which have been around for the, a little bit more, of it, more than a decade. Uh, and there, there is a little bit of, uh, I mean, more than a little bit. There, there is challenge with the reliability of the energy intake data, and I'll get back to that. But the core idea is we uh, basically get this data to be able to uh, estimate what are the kind of robust equations that tell what would a typical person, a typical individual um, have as energy intake, and then what would be the distribution of energy intake over time for different individuals in the United States. And that's a kind of a tricky uh, equation to estimate because we don't care only about the mean, but we also care about the whole distribution because obviously it comes from the distribution. It doesn't come from the mean. So we have to control for a lot of things because these are self-measures. Uh, so there is just random variation in how much uh, energy intake you have today versus tomorrow, which doesn't tell that much about your underlying average energy intake if, as an individual. And then that average itself is changing over time. So I might be in the 95 fifth percentile in terms of energy intake uh, today, but in two years I might be in a different percentile. And how those uh, kind of uh, percentiles of energy intake for individuals are also changing once you have the distribution predicted. So there is quite a bit of work here, and some of those we can't really contain within the enhanced data, which means we have to estimate them using um, the model. I mean, we, we can't just use the statistical uh, uh, models, but we kind of do our best to estimate an initial equation for uh, the energy intake and physical activity. And then those, th th there remains a couple of free parameters. Most importantly, uh, how fast people move their um, percentile in terms of energy intake and physical activity over time, uh, which needs to be estimated uh, in the next step, which is when we pit the model uh, of a population of individuals against uh, the data. So in this step, basically, as I said, we have the 
first step, we have the enhanced data used for a statistical estimation of equations for energy intake and physical activity. Now, once you have those two equations, uh, potentially with a couple of unknown parameters, you feed them into the core model, which has a population of 6,000 individuals uh, simulated in, your, uh, in our uh, simulation environment. And you can see what happens to uh, weight distributions or BMI distributions of different members of this population um, over time. And you can then compare those predictions versus what has happened in the enhanced for people with the same exact socioeconomic characteristics. So, and then by comp basically by trying to fitting these two together, and the, the fitting process uh, uses uh, a fairly uh, well-established method called uh, simulated method of moments, which compares the mean and the standard deviation or uh, other moments you could also use for weight for these people in the data with versus those that are coming from the simulated model. By minimizing the difference between these, we can try to find those unknown parameters. And there are not that many of those unknown parameters. So the model is fairly uh, contained. Now I'll get to some of the caveats that uh, this process has had. Mm -hmm. And the, so, so once you do this, go through this whole process, now you have a model that is reasonably well uh, fitted to the data. So this is kind of the output of the model versus output of the data for some of the, the subpopulations within those 6,000 people. So the 6,000 people include uh, all kinds of uh, different race and ethnicity and uh, ages and gender. So here are Mexican boys, teenagers. Uh, data is in uh, red from 2006 to uh, enhanced data. The simulations are in blue. So these are kind of the distribution. And these are the two that have been, for example, we, we have been trying to uh, match against each other. Uh, and if you look at all different uh, subpopulations, uh, there is a reasonable match. There are, in, in a few places, we see uh, systematic differences between the two. So the model is not. Uh, the x-axis, uh, so this is a histogram. These are uh, different uh, bins for, age, for weight. So these are cl weight in kilogram uh, histograms for different populations. Thank you for the question. So um, what we see is that actually at, at older ages, we don't, we, we, the model is kind of underestimating what's happening uh, in terms of the weight. And basically going back into the data and trying to figure out where it is coming from, the most likely explanation is that uh, it's reporting bias in energy intake, in enhanced energy intake, which is well known. And uh, I think it is significant enough that it can basically derail uh, some of the estimations for the older ages. And, and so we have to uh, correct for that. And that's kind of one of the next steps that we are working on. Now, so, so all this work has gone into trying to come up with a reasonably robust core population level model that we can use for uh, intervention analysis and policy analysis. And that, so the next step, we need to have uh, c basically capture the mechanisms for any intervention in how it influences either energy intake or physical activity. These are the really the two drivers of the uh, weight distributions. And so the kind of conceptual uh, model for that is uh, any intervention has some fractional impact on either physical activity or energy intake, uh, either making it less, hopefully, for energy intake and hopefully more for physical activity. Um, so there is kind of a, a steady state impact of the intervention. There is also a delay in implementation of that intervention uh, into that setting. And so you need additional parameters for any new intervention to be able to really measure its impact and uh, implement that into the model. And then you can go into all kinds of different interventions. Uh, Alice had an example earlier on about the impact of uh, removing competitive foods. Uh, and of course, uh, there are a lot of caveats on how you want to implement such a case. This is the most naive implementation in the sense that we say, if there are, in average, 180 kilocalories taken from competitive foods and we remove competitive foods, 180 kilocalories go away. Yeah, that's really naive because there are all kinds of substitution effects and uh, unintended consequences. Uh, this is just to give a feel for what the model does, not to uh, kind of give any estimate of what the impact of this policy would be. And uh, so this is looking at a cohort of uh, children who um, 
they're born in 2004 and going through K through 12 starting from 2011, and what would happen to their weight distribution as a result of uh, this policy implementation, and that and this is the mean weight over time. And on the right-hand side, we have the distribution of weight for these children uh, at the end of high school. And so, it's 2022, I think. Um, so that's kind of, and, and you can, of course, calculate all kinds of BMI and obesity percentiles and so on from this type of data. So the big picture, what we have been trying to do, uh, and some of the results that we have gotten, is basically creating a model that is validated, uh, fairly flexible to be applied to different uh, policy analysis contexts, and is robust uh, against um, extreme conditions and different scenarios, uh, so that new res people who want to apply this model don't need to estimate its parameters again. Uh, it can be plugged in into any uh, new hypothetical intervention or uh, real-world in intervention for which we have data, and then you can validate the model predictions against uh, experimental work if there is a, uh, experimental uh, cases for which we have data uh, to compare with. Uh, it's also kind of in terms of methodological uh, contributions uh, and it, using the simulated method of moments uh, in this context with this level of complexity is uh, fairly uh, new. And in terms of next steps, as I said, this is still ongoing work. So uh, we, we see some, bi uh, some uh, underestimation of the uh, body weight that comes from the data, most likely from the energy intake uh, problems with uh, and hence, so uh, we are hoping to take care of that and solve that to either use um, alternative data sources or uh, basically assume that everything about our core model is correct and then uh, individual model is correct and try to backtrack what is happening in the energy intake. Uh, and then we are hoping that we will continue to build on this work to um, basically cross-validate the results of this model by comparing it with uh, other model estimates uh, for, uh, for other uh, an estimate that what would happen with interventions that have been applied and done. Uh, so th that's one way of uh, validation. Uh, also in incorporate new uh, interventions, different policies, and try to uh, assess their impact. That's the ultimate usefulness of this model comes from those types of studies. Uh, we could also try to use this model and try to backtrack what actually has been happening in energy intake, for which we don't have really good uh, individual level data. So basically, um, use this model as a fairly complex way of imputing energy intake data uh, for the US over the last few decades. So that's another potential uh, direction. Um, I also wanted to touch upon a couple of issues in terms of process and what we have learned. So uh, in, we, this has been a new experience working with multiple teams who are uh, doing modeling in the similar area. We have uh, two in-person meetings annually and some more uh, over the Fun and uh, six now seven teams actually another team joined uh, lately uh, that use different methods. Uh, it it has been very good to see how people with different tools are thinking about these problems, trying to conceptualize it, and where different methods add most value. Uh, and we see in, for all, each kind of question there is uh, some benefit from one using one method versus another. So uh, I think the learning experience for the teams have been pretty good. Uh, and I think if we have some common sub problems to uh, focus on trying to answer the same question using two different methods, uh, we should probably get some additional cross-fertilization uh, in the comparative work. And hopefully, we'll do more of those uh, in the coming uh, months or years. And also, kind of more specifically about things, uh, I, kind of synergies between different teams uh, with Team 5, which I, I'm sure you will enjoy the presentation shortly. Um, there, there are two different approaches uh, that we have taken in th these uh, Team 4 versus Team 5. So uh, this work that uh, Team 4 has been doing has been more literature driven and trying to uh, drive the parameters using quantitative data, whereas Team 5 has been taking on a more community driven modeling process. And you, you will see that each approach has uh, its strengths in some uh, addressing some questions that, I mean, the community driven process 
uh, leads to a lot of interesting insights that we could never get from our uh, data-driven and literature-driven uh, modeling process. On the other hand, I think this process provides some more robust uh, biological model that can be used by Team 5. So there are synergies between the two groups to uh, work together and learn from each other. And there's uh, uh, with other teams in CompMod, we see uh, fairly uh, good synergies with each team I'd, because you guys haven't seen their work it's probably harder to go into details of that uh, with that I give it back to Alice to kind of uh, talk a little bit about her experience as a non-modeler working on a modeling project So this has really been an exercise in learning lots of different languages, methodologies, and um, I have to admit that I was pr pretty much of a skeptic when I started this process. I thought it sounded intriguing, so I thought, um, let's give it a try. But it, um, I do a lot with a dietary assessment as well, and we often talk about the black box, you know, when you feed all your nutrients in and then you, or you feed all the foods in and at the end of it you get the nutrients out. You don't really know exactly how it's all been calculated, what some of the uh, estimates, parameters are. Um, this really seemed like a black box where we're plugging things in, um, we have to make a whole lot of assumptions, we don't have a lot of data in a lot of these areas that we'd really like to have, um, so, so what does it all mean? But as we've been working more, and Hajir's been very patient with me explaining <laughs> all these things and trying to understand the processes. And um, one way I think of it is kind of like an interactive logic model. You, you know, you really have to map out um, what you're thinking about all the different factors that are involved that get you to the end. And, and what's appealing to me, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but the Hajir promises me that we can do these tweaking things where we set up a model that what, which may include some assumptions, but then we're able to say, well, what if we increase the sugar sweetened beverage tax by two cents, you know, per ounce? You know, what will happen at the end? What's the, uh, you know, having built in things like um, uh, maybe that will cause um, consumption to go down, maybe it will cause people to drink more juice, which actually will have the same amount of calories. You know, there will be a number of things that will have to be considered there, but you can actually um, see what that looks like. Um, I think it really forces you, not only facilitates uh, identifying a really wide range of potential policy influences, and I played around with that a little bit earlier when I talked about the competitive foods, and, and then really think about the relative impact. A, a big challenge is to find you know, whatever data you can to actually plug in there to, to be able to, to actually run some of these models. Um, but then it does give that option to, to try to some what if sort of scenarios because I think with a lot of policy again it's not as simple as just you know taking away competitive foods and then seeing the kids um, BMIs go down I, I think there are many other factors in there um, and it is possible through sensitivity analysis to really help prioritize prioritize some of the uh, the estimations and so uh, I think uh, Patty's reminded us we have to keep in mind that uh, even though there are many uncertainties here there's a lot of uncertainties in other forms of uh, modeling and analysis and so we we have to kind of live with that in many things that we do so I guess thoughts for skeptical researchers who might uh, be like me where we're used to more kind of linear randomized trial approaches um, we currently have very few tools that help us evaluate policy. Um, I like to use the term policy happens. You know, we can't write a grant to NIH except in maybe some rare circumstances and say, okay, we're going to assign Los Angeles to do sugar sweetened beverage tax and New York City is going to not do it. They're going to be the control group and then we look at what happens. You know, you could raise all the questions of are they comparable and all that sort of thing. But uh, for the most part, except for maybe you could get a school district would be willing to try one policy in one school and not another. But for the most part, we just have to kind of jump on uh, with what's going on and, and try to understand what, what's happening. We can't apply a lot of our usual sort of research design. And I found that just simply creating the model and try to think it through has been a really um, useful exercise to try to think through all the different issues and realize how much data we do and in most cases don't have. Um, it, it helps with this really thinking through the unforeseen impacts, the um, possible unintended consequences. 
Um, and it is um, certainly possible to get some database estimates of magnitude. And if it's not available, in some cases, we'll have some pieces of it, but not all. And there are ways to make some estimates. As long as we, I guess I would say, as, uh, my final point is, as long as we really acknowledge the assumptions that we're making and recognize that we're not coming out with truth when it comes to what policy should be, um, that it can give us a lot of opportunity to really learn more and I think over time it will also help inform where we really have gaps in research and you know if we had this one little piece that we could plug into the model that would really help it to be more robust so I think there's a lot of potential here I think it's not a magic solution but I think it's something certainly worth um, working with I think I'll just stick with this. Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, to keep this on? Okay, sure. Great. Thanks, Hajir. Okay, so. Um, so our project is going to, uh, as, as Hajir has kind of teased you a little bit, um, going to go into a little bit more focus. Sorry, get it, the slides up there first. Oh, it is. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. Um, so we're going to um, look at some of these new system science methods um, trying to understand the role of social determinants on childhood obesity and our focus is primarily at the community level and we're going to be looking at not only uh, developing community models but actually as you've kind of heard a little bit working with the community to develop these models and so Peter's going to talk a lot about a group model building approach in, in a few minutes and so um, I am actually uh, get the privilege of introducing our team. So we've actually been working with the West End community, and, and Peter will share a little bit more detail um, in a few moments. But uh, Washington University uh, Social System Design Lab, Peter's team, our team at TransTria, um, who has been working also in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, luckily, we, we are both in the same location, which has been nice to meet together, and then to work with the community. And you see several different groups that are represented. OK. Slides aren't moving forward. Okay. <laughs> These are moving forward. But I, I see what's the problem. But I was trying to. Yeah, I think the problem is that the other presentation is already on. It hasn't been. What I see here is different than what you see there. Sorry. <laughs> OK. All right. So um, on the left-hand side, you see some of the different groups that we've been working with in the West End community. Um, we actually have been working primarily through the faith-based community, but working with other groups. Um, community residents have been joining and working with us and we've been working with them for a little over a year now so um, we've actually um, been moving towards uh, some good modeling work that Peter is going to be talking about in a moment. Down arrow. Okay there we go. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is setting the stage a little bit for this idea of complexity. So I think that already the stage has been somewhat set by Alice and Hajir in terms of thinking about complexity. We're going to be looking at kind of this focal point here of social determinants of obesity at the community level. And th I'm going to talk about it a little bit in terms of both detail complexity. And, and so you've heard a little bit about that. I'm going to see what your tolerance for complexity is here today. Um, and, and hopefully all of you are willing and ready to embrace complexity um, and then dynamic complexity and Peter is going to talk a little bit more about that in terms of the models. Luckily I don't have to click through too many slides. Okay. So what I'd like to do is talk about this um, idea of complexity in a few different ways. The first way is in terms of thinking about the evidence base and evaluation and, and how do we actually learn from what's happening in the communities. 
And so this image that you see here is actually uh, adapted from the work of Larry Green that states, if we want more evidence-based practice, we need more practice-based evidence. And so that inherently is some of the driver for why, why we need to work with communities. And the Institute of Medicine also identifies the need for better guidance and support to communities um, for well-reasoned actions that create child-friendly, health-promoting communities. And this guidance is, is dependent on a meaningful evidence base, and we, we're just not there yet, as Alice has also alluded to already. And so, you know, we know at one end of the spectrum, we have these systematic reviews that have um, actually suggested that there are some policy and environment strategies, particularly in the area of physical activity that are making an impact. Um, but we also know at the other end of the spectrum, we have all of this work happening in communities around policy system and environment change. And how do we get more of that into the evaluation and evidence base? And, and across the whole spectrum, we have several issues around policy and environment change that are a little bit different than the way we think about programs and promotional efforts. And so, you know, we need to understand what are the key decision-making factors, um, population exposure to different policies and environments. How do we think about exposure? Um, thinking about adoption, implementation, enforcement over time, sustainability, all of these issues really come into play more as you think about the community level and the community perspective on change. Um, in addition, we need to think about outcome measures. And, and as we know from the evidence already, that there are a wide range of different outcome measures for physical activity, for food uh, consumption, for ob overweight and obesity, um, BMI, waist circumference, accelerometry data, three-day food recall diaries, surveys. And we've been spending a lot of time looking at this evidence base. And it's really hard to compare across different strategies and what types of impacts are being made because everybody's measuring it in a different way. And so in order for us to start understanding the story, we need to really um, get, get some insights into how to tell that story. Um, the identification of characteristics of policy, system, and environment changes. So you see across the top of the arrow as we move from evidence to policy and practice, we need to understand more about those key ingredients. What, what is it that actually is creating change at the local level? Um, we also know that many of these policy system and environment components are part of um, a system in, in the community. They're happening as part of multi um, uh, focused efforts, not only in terms of individual intervention approaches, but also through these community demonstration projects like um, the community put, Communities Putting Prevention to Work and others, that there are multiple efforts happening at the same communities. And so how do we even begin to think about this issue of attribution? Um, thinking about individual policy or environment changes, how do we begin to think about um, that complexity of what is making the difference in the changes that we may be seeing related to either overweight and obesity or population levels of physical activity and food consumption. I'm going to continue forward, hopefully, and talk a little bit about and talk a little bit about implementation challenges. There are several other challenges I can talk about with respect to evidence and evaluation, but you, you guys might be bored to tears by the end. Um, so this model actually is drawn from the work of Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities. It's a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded national program of 50 community demonstration projects that um, are designed to inform how policy system and environment changes in communities can affect behaviors and health. And the, this program places a special emphasis on reaching children who are at highest risk for obesity. So looking specifically at things like race, ethnicity, um, income, and geographic location as indicators. So it, it actually ties in nicely to our focus here on social determinants. Um, the logic model itself represents or illustrates some of the complexity of the different layers of influence. So a little bit different way of thinking about um, the complexity that where the community is the focus and it's represented here by the orange um, community programs and, and promotions, as well as the green layers that look at local policy and environment changes, as well as the subsystems and systems in the, in the local community, which there are a wide variety. And so when we start to talk about um, complexity and we start to look at um, all of the different levels of influence, we start to talk about 
local government. Um, we start to talk about agriculture. We t talk about schools, urban planning, design. The list goes on and on. And, and within each of those different um, disciplines and sectors, there's going to be a set of complex variables at, at, at play here, too. So I think it's easy to see how this um, kind of compounds and, and gets magnified. And then I also just want to highlight here that you see that we're um, looking at the influences at, of national and state level policy and environment changes or influences, as well as then at the bottom, the purple le level, for those of you who can't see it, is macro social systems. And so all of this in that larger context of cultural and psychosocial influences and social determinants. And so I'm actually going to talk for one moment about the social uh, determinants piece. And so this is an illustration. Um, at where the tree model is kind of highlighting some of the analogous pathways uh, between social determinants to behaviors and health. And so in the tree model, you see that social determinants are represented in the soil. And I know you probably can't see that, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see it online at some point. Um, but uh, these may include things like institutional racism, poverty, lack of access to healthy foods. And in the wilted tree, um, that those are kind of the, the negative social determinants, if you will. Uh, on, on the other side, on the right-hand side of the screen, you see more quality schools, jobs, good access to recreational facilities and things like that. And so as we think about the social determinants, those are kind of what's influencing the health of the tree from, from the nourishment piece. Um, continuing on with this analogy, uh, the community assets and barriers are also illustrated here in terms of the tree trunks. And so the wilted tree may experience things like powerlessness in the community, disconnected members, um, fragmented systems that aren't working together, uh, disinvestment from outside resources. And on the flip side, the thriving tree may have a strong sense of community, good social networks, civic participation, political influence, uh, other factors at play there. And as you can see in both trees, it's not that we're eliminating all of the health conditions. We're still going to have some of these challenges, but, but we're creating an environment, a policy, a system in place. And so we need to understand what are those pathways. Um, we, we can illustrate it through this tree example because we can't really explain it in other ways. But we have to move towards um, methods that allow us to begin to become more explicit about what are those relationships and how do they work. And so what I get the luxury of today is presenting to you all of this complexity and then not having to talk at all about how we're going to handle it. So Peter. Thank you, Laura. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about let's set up. about how we go about uh, or how we proposed and, and been thinking about going about this with uh, system dynamics. So uh, when Laura and I started talking about this and, and starting to think about what, what would be the contribution from our project within CompMod, one of the exciting possibilities was to really unpack this idea of understanding the social determinants of the, and the community level. And, and we. Uh, and Laura presented her, uh, uh, we were talking about this initially, about all this complexity, and I thought that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's about as messy as you can get. Um, so, um, and one of the advantages of CompMod is we have different teams doing different things. So could we take and really take the group model building and push it, really involve the community, and then you could compare that with uh, what other studies we're doing and see, well, what, what happens when you make that comparison? Do you end up with different models? Uh, are they very idiosyncratic to each community? Um, how does the community feel about model where they were involved in developing the process? And so we took that challenge on and, and we're quite excited about it. Um, so there are a number of different ways you could think about what the traditional approach is and how they can be um, limited. Uh, for example, when you're thinking about community context, the structure of the system may be unknown. Um, and it's not just because you don't have enough data, it's because the community is changing. It's a dynamic system. It's always in flux. And in fact, as we start to go into community and start working communities, the systems change. The communities are socially constructed. Um, and so we can use, for example, I'll talk about group model building as a way to address that, that limitation. 
uh, when we think about evidence, what kind of evidence do we have for all of these uh, essentially natural experiments that are occurring but we're not collecting data on it, or uncertainty about the estimates of the effects. So Hashir and Alice already talked about this and Laura as well. When we start thinking about evaluating this intervention, um, it's, it's inherently challenging to actually think about communities don't just get one, like um, Alice was pointing out, we don't just do one intervention in one community and get to have a control. Multiple things are happening concurrently. How do you pull apart all those effect sizes? Um, and again, that's an approach where we can start to talk about it uh, with system dynamics. And then when we think about implementation, um, there are a number of different facets to this. Um, you could know that something's working quite effectively, but then um, the community's response to that might be quite negative. Uh, or there may be a whole set of reasons, uh, the pushback that uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, resources not being available in the community and so on. Uh, so how do you scale these up to actually achieve population level health? So there's a number of issues that have been quite challenging problems uh, with traditional approaches and, and our approach that we're trying to sort of develop here and, and push is really thinking about the potential of SD and applying it uh, using the group model building um, techniques uh, to address those limitations. So the overall project is, is uh, to develop a system dynamic simulation model uh, where we're trying to understand the social determinants um, that influence the dynamics of childhood obesity. So we talk about dynamics, we're talking about how, that, how the obesity trends are changing that particular community, as well as the implementation of prevention strategies. So do you get an initial prevention strategy that gets some interest, but then people kind of give up, or does it really scale up nicely? Uh, can you sustain it over time? and can you actually uh, achieve population level impact. So we want to understand those two pieces uh, together with respect to social determinants. And it could easily be that social determinants have one kind of role, for example, in terms of causing the uh, obesity uh, problem, and then actually play a different kind of role when you're thinking about actual implementation and scale-up issues. So in terms of the basic approach, we're, we're taking a single case uh, uh, research, a single case study research design uh, with the West End community. Um, it's a community-driven approach, and I should say by community-driven, we, we, we're pushing this notion that we really actually want the community members and, and representatives from the community to, to make decisions about the model, the process, the design, the cultural appropriateness of the questions, uh, bring them, uh, involve them in actual facilitation of group model building session, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why, why you would want to do that. Um, and then the emphasis in this particular approach uh, in system dynamics is understanding how these dynamics are generated through a series of feedback mechanisms. Um, when we think about implementation strategies, the one point I'll just sort of add here is we're thinking actually, and uh, prevention, we're, we're thinking both about things like a soda tax that might be part of a national debate, but we're also very interested in do you end up with different kinds of strategies that the community identified, and how do they compare to some of the national strategies? So. We're looking at both things from things like policy reviews, but also from the community. Um, so how do we go about doing this? So uh, to set the stage here a little bit, I, I, um, I'd like to draw on uh, Paul Meal's uh, uh, work earlier in thinking about how you deal with the problem of testing theories in complex uh, social systems. And, and the point here I want to make with this slide is, is that uh, Paul Meal was pointing out that when you have these complex systems, actually, it's not so much that you need more sophisticated statistics. What you actually need are better theories that, in terms of mathematically specified, um, that you need to be able to articulate how you think things are working in mathematical form before you can really sort of get into entertaining, you know, what are the parameter estimates when you're talking about really sort of complex systems like this. Um, and that doesn't mean you don't need sophisticated statistics. It just means you're not going to solve the problem without having a better, a better theory. Um, so that's one point. Um, another point that's, that's been part of system dynamics, um, I'm having, wait, there we go, um, has been how you think about building information, using information to build these kinds of models, particularly when you're thinking about the community level, variables that aren't collected, and you're thinking then in marginalized communities where uh, there's actually very little data on, on some of the things that we would just expect to be normal. Um, and ordinary for many other communities. Um, and this has actually been part of the system dynamics method for, for a long time. Um, this is a slide that I've adapted from Jay Forrester talking about information sources for the na uh, model of the national economy. And one of Forrester's points were uh, in, in making this presentation that we know a lot more about systems uh, 
uh, from our own mental databases and observation. That's sort of the widest array. Our written database is considerably smaller, and then the actual sort of numeric, the actual hard data we might have in a system is, is much, much smaller. And, um, and one of the challenges in working with, with uh, thinking about things at the community levels is which variables do you include? What connections, what associations do you start to privilege over others? How do you think about something like structural racism working in terms of the actual social mechanism, not as a, not where you're using race, for example, as a proxy for assessing determinants, but how do you actually understand the social mechanisms being in play? And that could vary quite, quite a bit from one community to the next. Um, and so we think about using different approaches to pull data from different ways. Um, so we think of uh, using group model building and direct observation, for example, for helping us understand the mental database of how people are thinking about the system. And that can be very useful understanding structure. Um, then you can drill down and you can start to work more uh, on the literature. And Hashir gave uh, excellent uh, examples of talking about a literature-driven model. And then you can get down to the point of actually building model structure and using parameter estimates from secondary data. And, and then also uh, future experiments, I mean, uh, putting that on the table that once you have these models, they actually suggest prospective experiments for estimating particular parameters. And so that's how we're, we're thinking about it, beginning sort of at this very top level as opposed to at the literature level um, with a community. So let me give you a very brief overview of what we mean by group model building. Uh, it's really a community-driven participatory approach. And here you see a picture actually of some of the uh, core modeling team. The core modeling team is responsible for actually making, essentially it's a steering committee making decisions about the design of the activities, the exercises, the protocols we're using, actually making decisions about the model, uh, what steps are made, uh, are, are done with uh, the core modeling team, for example, with the viewing the results from some analysis versus being done outside the modeling team. So this is, a, this is our key decision-making group. Um, and it includes both representatives from Transtria, the Social System Design Lab, as well as the West End community. Um, and here you see a couple examples of, of uh, us meeting. And I think in this one, we're actually designing the process that we're going to use to, uh, um, that's what we're doing at that point. Um, and so we have these on a pretty regular basis. Usually it's on average about every two or three weeks we're meeting with a core modeling team. Um, so um, some of the reasons that uh, sort of in a broader sense why you'd want to think about uh, using group model building would be uh, design of methods as we're, we're talking about. Um, also in terms of facilitation of exercise. So if we're working in a community, what we want to make sure is that we have facilitation that's culturally appropriate, you understand the politics of that particular stakeholder group or set of participants and so forth. Um, we also, uh, and so facilitation is an important part, and, and just to give you a context, uh, we can do this kind of exercise in different languages, so we've done this in India, in Telugu, Hindi, Marathi, and so forth, by training up the core modeling team to conduct uh, exercises, so it's pretty generalizable and robust in that sense. Um, one of the things that it's often used for is, is really conceptualizing the system, and that's a, you, you generate causal maps often or some other type of exercise that help you sort of define the system boundary. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty common. And then also thinking about model specification and formulation. You may have an idea that there's an association, but, but, but exactly how does that work and sort of begin to involve the community in trying to at least get some initial ideas of what those structures might be. Um, one of the big benefits and early motivations for system dynamics was that you're really building a shared conceptual view of a system. So um, initially, uh, early in the history of system dynamics, models were built and then the results were presented. They drew on a lot of data and information and, and direct observation and key informants, but often the participants and decision makers who had to be involved in the actual implementation weren't sufficiently involved to really understand the insights. And so one of the arguments would be, well, the modeler is getting lots of insights on these systems. Uh, what would happen if you began to bring in other participants, other stakeholders in the model building process? Um, wouldn't they develop the insights along the way? And that's actually been pretty interesting because there's certainly been some insights we've expected and then also been many insights we had not expected um, that came from the community. Um, and then uh, the capacity to, to apply and do system dynamics has been an important part. So those are just some of the, the reasons. Um, I won't say too much more about the, the, the community, but um, this just gives you a very 90,000 foot view of, of the, the West End community. It's about 6,300 uh, people, primarily African-American, pretty high poverty rate. 
uh, St. Louis um, has, um, um, there's a lot of disparities within St. Louis, and this particular community uh, actually lost its school um, a number of years ago. Uh, and so uh, certainly within St. Louis, um, that, that makes it even more uh, marginalized. And it's also a very dynamic community. There's some really positive things that are happening. There's some transitions and so forth. So it's interesting from that perspective as well. Um, this slide main point here is just that this represents many of the kinds of social determinants we're concerned about in thinking about obesity. There's no grocery store. There's a, there's a deli uh, where kids can buy snacks on the way to, to the school bus stops, and that's their breakfast, for example. The sidewalks are cracked, although they've actually um, used these slides to advocate for changes in the sidewalk and repaving. So that's an example of a dynamic system, just collecting the data and now the system has changed. They have some parks here, uh, but they're often not used because of the, the crime. And uh, we actually have uh, just hired an intern who pointed out that she used to be able to play uh, in that park, but her sisters can no longer play at that park because of the, of the concerns about uh, crime and so on. Um, there are some community gardens that are starting up as well, and a lot of interest in pursuing that. In terms of the actual model structure, we think about this as sort of having three levels, and we're primarily focusing on this on this level, this meso level of the social determinants and built environment, um, where we then have a population health structure. Um, and what I'll move into now is sort of talking mostly about sort of the group model building, and then talk a little bit more about how we uh, uh, formalize that system. So this is an example of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now start talking a little bit about what we came up with from the first group model building session uh, working with a set of, of clergy. And this is a causal map. So this is a, a, a pictorial description of the causal associations. Um, the linkages here, what, what we started the sessions with were essentially this box, which is weight, uh, cohort weight. And we asked people, what are things that contribute to kids gaining and losing weight in the West End community? And what I'm going to unfold is actually a simplified version of what came out of that discussion from, from the clergy and then a second session with health service providers. So here you see weight. Um, it's influenced by uh, unhealthy eating. Um, and it also, <coughs> this is the pointer, um, you see weight is influenced by unhealthy eating. It contributes, the, the more weight you have, it contributes to a weight gap depending on your weight norm. And one of the things that we picked up on this very quickly is actually um, for, for girls, for example, they might tend to want to lose weight, but actually boys, because of the amount of bullying, were actually trying to gain weight. So we moved from just assuming that it was always about losing weight to actually some of the behavior was actually trying to about gain weight and, and, and just be physically heavier to protect yourself. That leads to dieting behavior, which influences weight. And one of the first things that people also pointed out was, well, the dieting here is often not very healthy, so people get sick. Um, so the, the, the pluses here mean that more weight leads to a larger weight gap, or a larger weight gap leads to larger weight di uh, dieting. Um, and the minuses mean that you know, the more you diet, uh, the, the lower your weight. Um, the double arrows here, when you get sick, it's not an immediate effect, so there's a delay. And so that's what these, these uh, d hash marks, sorry. Uh, represent. And so you see there's multiple feedback loops, even this very simple model. There's one feedback loop here, there's another one that goes through here. We see a small one over here, that's your immediate one. And this represents a very, you know, uh, go ahead. <coughs> the, the, this is the, this is the gap, this is the gap, sorry, this is the gap between the weight norm for your, for your gender and your weight. Um, and so that could go up and high. You know, there could be uh, different directions to that. Um, very quickly, we started talking about also the role of, of weight and self-esteem and, and basically comfort eating. So you see this long feedback loop here. Here's another stock is self-esteem. And this is basically a story about how people uh, feeling low self-esteem would seek out comfort foods and buy unhealthy snacks, and that would lead to unhealthy eating. Um, and then there was a story that came out in the same session um, about the, um, the fast food restaurants. And this turned out to be a quite interesting dynamic. Um, we, we talk about this in the literature a lot. Um, but uh, what's interesting here, it was actually a potentially an unintended consequence of an education policy where residents started going off to college and, and norms started shifting around foods at that point. And so people talked about the changes in transitions um, around about what the term here was mindset of meals. And the other point I would make here is that um, 
this term here, designed for a purpose based on population serving, that was a term we thought meant marketing, but the community actually had a very specific interpretation, and it actually embeds a whole bunch of population dynamics about people going off to college, coming back, raising families, and so there's a whole demography story behind this. Um, the other point that came out here was just parents knowing how to prepare meals. So this is one session. It, it's, it was a much more, it was sort of a Jackson Pollock painting at the end of the 90 minutes, and this is the, this is the simplified version of that um, that we work with. Um, we then had a, a second session with providers, and you see some additional things. And this is uh, nurses, physicians who are meeting with residents from the West End. And they pointed out some of the issues, for example, that they were seeing in the parents, the social issues of the parents, and how hard it was uh, for a number of reasons, like uh, low income and trying to just make ends meet and not having time to buy food or plan meals. Um, also, um, there was a whole set of issues here about physical activity and this idea of friendly environment. Is your physical environment a friendly place outside where you can go and do exercise? At this point, the, that particular community, the feeling it's not. Um, so you, you, you come home, you're dropped off from the school bus, you go immediately home because you don't, it's not really safe to be on the street. You play video games. Uh, parents aren't home feeling guilty about that. Um, and, 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 and so um, it, it's sort of a complex negotiation. So this was essentially two 90-minute exercises um, that came out of that. Um, what also comes out of this type of exercise are immediately suggestions about things that are working. And so they were talking about, for example, in the clergy session, these are things that the community identified that they could do, um, offering food at service and how that might change uh, preferences for unhealthy snacks, uh, advocating for having a school back in the neighborhood, which would give them a way to organize and implement uh, changes in the school. Um, and so the point there about the school is when your school is not in your neighborhood, you're actually diffusing the political power of the parents to actually influence uh, school policy. It's diluted. Um, and this would be a way to counteract that. Uh, ministers talking about physical health. So uh, Bishop George White, who's in, in part of the core modeling team, um, from one of the models actually started coming up with some sermons and talked about ungodly uh, social networks. Uh, and, and how, you're, how you need to take responsibility for, for people in your network. And, and he also presented at Institute for System Science and Health um, uh, earlier this year. So this is just an example of some of the interventions. And, and these are sort of, some of these are sort of low-hanging fruit. People just go ahead and they start implementing them. They don't wait for us to do simulation models. Um, but it's equally important to consider um, examples like what might happen if we implemented a soda tax uh, so this was a policy mapping exercise where we simply tried to, tried to understand from the community's perspective how they would see the soda tax uh, working in their neighborhood. Now, um, these are, this is a qualitative diagram. This is a causal map. And so the question we often get is, is how do you bring this uh, stuff back into a, a computer simulation model? Um, because that would be one of the major points of doing all this. And, um, and so uh, let me talk briefly about uh, how we think about specification and quantification. So all variables in system dynamic models are quantified. Uh, some may be tangible, some may be intangible, and some may be much harder to uh, measure than others. Uh, but we quantify all the variables, and then we think about once you have the variables quantified and, and it's, and it's uh, sort of logically consistent within your model, then you start to think about how do I go about measuring uh, some of these variables. So tangible variables are easy. If you're measuring weight, you should be thinking about kilograms or pounds, and, and that's easy to quantify and, and hopefully uh, much easier than some of the other ones to measure. Um, but you could also have intangible variables, like the level of stress or perceptions of safety in a neighborhood. And that might be much harder to think about in terms of quantification. Um, but there's some good work um, that people have done. It goes way back uh, by Stevens thinking about um, psychophysics and how people think about scales internally, cognitive constructs. And system dynamics has had the tradition. You could either think about, for example, a variable being quantified on a 0 to 100 scale with 50 being the present point or some baseline or zero to uh, infinity with one as being a normal point, which tends to be our preference. Um, then the, so once you've sort of quantified the variable, the first part here comes from the group model building um, directly. This comes from actually formula, starting to formulate the equations, and then you start to think about what's the nature of these, these interactions. And, uh, and I should say here that the way we're developing these equations, there's a difference between the way, for example, an engineer might use an equation to design a bridge 
versus the way uh, a, a physicist might measure a gravitational constant. The engineer might do a set of calculations and then run actually simulations, um, and 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 that's trying to dissolve uh, solve a, a design problem. And out of that, may realize I need to get a much better measurement of what the gravitational constant is for this particular bridge. And then that task becomes more of a scientific um, activity where you go out and you carefully measure that. And then the scientist might raise a new kind of question: Well, what if the gravitational constant is like this feeds back? So Allison and Hajira already talked about some of that. It's an iterative process, but it's important to realize when we're constructing these equations, this is much more the way an engineer might initially start, and then you begin to fill them in with more and more scientific detail. If you have a literature-driven approach, you're pulling those parameters from the beginning. If you're doing the group model building, you're backing up a step first before you get to that. And then you do a lot of testing. So you're thinking about dimensional consistency of the equations. You're thinking about the log logical consistency of range. If people's weights all of a sudden go negative, the model is obviously incorrect for logical reasons. And then you think about uh, the reproduction of, of observed or realistic behavior. So Laura was talking about stories, the stories in the community. Does the model retell the story in a way that, that's uh, consistent with what people meant? And that's sort of an important validation test. Um, and then we do the, 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 one of the main advantages of system dynamic models. These are differential equation models. And they are very, very uh, at the aggregate level. And so they're actually pretty fast to simulate um, relative to agent-based models, which means you can do a lot of simulation to do sensitivity analysis on all of these variables, uh, much more so than you could uh, for the same computational power uh, for, than an agent-based model. Um, so when we're thinking then about translating the qualitative maps to quantitative simulation model, you can think about it. We have the policy over here, uh, and then we end up with some uh, change in weight here. And, and the basic point of this slide is, is, is that initially when we're working like an engineer and trying to work out some of these equations, we're thinking in terms of ratios and then we begin to sort of, uh, we can qualify these ratios by being more systematic and understanding the in association. So if we find a particular association is, is, is um, um, the ratio of, of, of a particular relationship has a, a big impact in the system. And then we say, well, what happens if that's nonlinear? We put in a, a, a table function that describes that, and then we start to vary that and see whether or not we end up with different kinds of policy recommendations or different kinds of behavior. If it turns out to make a difference, then you need to go out and measure that much more carefully. Uh, if it doesn't make, it out, make a big difference, then you focus on your higher priority um, uh, variables and associations. Um, and then I'm going to just sort of briefly talk about what we see, how we operationalize this piece, because that's a little bit uh, unique to what we, we do here. Um, and this is just the cohort weight. Essentially, it's a stock where we're, we're actually simulating the weight of uh, uh, birth weight, uh, age cohorts from the third to the 97th uh, birth weight percentile. Um, and so one of the reasons for doing that is you also have these, at these small population levels, you also have these population dynamics. So you, you need to be able to track migration. And you need to be able to think about how an income a community developing going up, uh, in, for example, in the average household income um, and bringing in a new uh, set of children might change that distribution. And that's the kind of thing that we want to be able to capture with that. Um, so. <coughs> What do we get from this as an output? This is a simulation run. This is actually simulating um, essentially the base case of the CDC uh, growth curve. So we take the CDC growth curves and we're just sort of simulating the growth curves as if there is no obesity epidemic. epidemic. And uh, here you see this is for the 1970, but we're actually simulating 1970 cohort, 1971 cohort, 1972 cohort from the third birth weight percentile up to the 97th. So there's actually a lot of cohorts moving through this. But just for simplicity, we'll just look at this one. And what you see here are the weights for the fifth percentile, 10th, 20th, so up to the 95th percentile. So any child in, in this, uh, and this is the reference, um, essentially the, the, the reference population that would be above this would be considered obese. And if we had no obesity epidemic, by that definition, 5% of the population would, or 5% of the children would be obese. Um, in this one, because we're only simulating um, up to age uh, 22 uh, with the children's growth curves, but it's actually correct. It goes up. Uh, that is, there's a you can continue on, and then there's a the, the growth curve as people get older, it starts to go down. And you can think about um, in in terms of of weight distribution this, for children. This is what it what it looks like, and it just goes into adult. But we can actually extend this approach. 
and think about what's the normal distribution of weight for adults. And that becomes important when you start to think about older adults and also interactions between cancer and obesity and, and so forth. And, and, and there's some work that we're doing there that actually suggests, for example, that uh, obesity might work as a protective factor for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma treatment uh, with a some work that a colleague, Ken Carson, um, is, is, is developing. Um, but the point is we can extend this. Right now it just flattens out because we're simulating um, children. Um, and then what we're doing in this one, uh, here you see um, an increase in, a, in essentially uh, an obesity epidemic. And what we're simulating here is then the shift in that distribution. So all of the lines above the red, if there's no risk, they would, have, they would have stayed below this red line. But now these are the percentiles that are above the 95th percentile, so they would, they would be obese. And from that, we can pull um, a prevalence of children being um, essentially over, overweight. Um, and this is, this is what's relevant at the end of the day for being able to think about what would be the population level impact. So we can, we can pull that out in terms of an estimate. So in terms of some of the future work um, that we're foreseeing in this, um, the way we've set this up is, is we want to be able to, to simulate these uh, population dynamics. And so one of the things we want is much better microestimates of the population dynamics for the West End. And that's, that's a, a, a challenging problem, in part because um, the West, um, different neighborhoods within St. Louis have different uh, degrees that people are maintaining data on them. West End, people are not maintaining data on them. So how do you go about, we would need to sort of work with some demographers to think through that. Um, the approach of simulating growth curves has this advantage that it, 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 it resonates with the way a physician would look at a growth curve chart. And in principle, we should be able to sample um, a set of physicians, or specifically healthcare records of children, medical records of children from the West End, and construct a reference uh, con essentially construct what we call a reference mode, the distribution for that particular community. Uh, and we did that because the, the, re the, the, um, the likelihood that you're going to find marginalized communities where people have nice longitudinal data about BMI prevalence is probably pretty, pretty low if you're thinking about an arbitrary community, whereas you, you're, you might have a much better shot at being able to actually identify some of the uh, growth charts for children. Um, then also in terms of we have these table functions, initially they're conceptual and they're based from the community, but you want to cross-check that. So we have done that kind of work, for example, in India where we have a set of discussions and participatory meetings, but then you do a community survey to actually check out some of those specific values. Um, and then also compare, uh, and then we want to get a better distribution of the organizational demography of food establishments, that ones that have entered and left the community. Um, and I'll talk briefly then about comparisons with other compound and synergies. Uh, Hezier has already talked about some of the possibilities here. It's basically the same thing. Um, it's really interesting and important to be able to compare the community-driven with the, the literature-driven. And, and we'll learn a lot about, you know, in what way and where's the highest value, for example, of going through the effort of including communities. And how do you do that well? Uh, and what do you see as the differences? Um, as well as the core engine. So we, we don't we have a core engine that's just pulling essentially data directly from the growth curves. We're not trying to calculate the where Hezier's team is doing it. Um, and so it, it, it's, it, it would be really nice to sort of eventually just be able to use that core engine after they've, they've worked that. So you could think about this as a, uh, we've tried to construct this as almost like plug and play. We could easily plug in uh, better um, components from other Kanban teams as, as, um, as this develops. Some of the other compound teams uh, with, with Ross Hammond and, and Loret Dubay, for example, Team 2, um, they're doing a lot of work on this uh, uncomfort eating and actually the cellular and, uh, and the uh, psychological level, individual level, on that feedback loop, whereas we're getting the community perceptions. Uh, and so there's some really interesting possibilities about, uh, you know, how do, how do those two models compare? Uh, what are the actual mechanisms which Team 2 would provide that, that, that explain that feedback loop. Um, and then just as another example, we might think about, for example, with Team 3, um, they're doing a lot, I'm sorry, Team Team 6 is doing a lot of, um, I got Team, I'm sorry, it is Team 3. Yeah, Team 3. Uh, it's doing a lot of work with, with social network analysis at neighborhood levels. So they're working at a similar unit of analysis as we are, uh, but we're not modeling social networks, although there are a lot of social network effects like gangs and passing information and food preferences. So one possibility is you think about disaggregating, comparing what they're having in terms of social network structure with what we're having, seeing whether, whether or not they're similar or different on some of the similar policy tests, but we can actually take their network data in summary form 
uh, from simulations and pull that in um, to some of our table functions as we as we work through. So there's a lot of, of, of really interesting um, possibilities here. And I'll hand it over now to um, I think Laura. Uh, do we want to take questions at the end? Is, is a quick question? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're just finishing up. So. Okay, so um, so just quickly, I want to just touch base a little bit, uh, as Alice did. Um, I think our group was actually very primed and ready for the system dynamics modeling piece. Uh, we've been working in the evidence reviews, and we've been really um, challenged by what's out there and available, particularly as we try to look at policy and environment changes and try to look at things like reach, look at adoption, look at implementation. There's not enough data out there even to really develop some standards for the field and how we think about those different concepts and, and, and building an evidence base. And so we really need to learn a lot more in those areas about what's happening at the community level. And then my other hat, um, evaluating these large community demonstration projects, we um, did one uh, for Active Living by Design, which was 25 communities, and now we're doing uh, this for Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities, which is 50 communities. And um, we, we use a very participatory approach to doing evaluation, and so we're actually not just trying to answer the researcher question of what study design do we use, what are the effect sizes, and all of that, but we're trying to look at the practice and policy questions too about how does this work, what are the costs, what are the um, different uh, roles and responsibilities of staff at um, different agencies in, in the local community versus community members and other things like that. And then also the advocates and the community members themselves who have questions about how is this really going to benefit us, are these changes going to be equitably distributed across communities. And so we were very primed and ready to think about um, new methods and, and new ways of, of looking at all of this information. And so I think reflecting on what Peter has just talked about, the group model building piece resonated really well for us. Um, we do a lot of work and facilitation in communities. And so that actually has been kind of a natural fit for our two organizations and, and working with the communities. And we've actually uh, learned a lot uh, through the graphical modeling. And I think that uh, one of the things that, that we've learned is that, you know, taking these logic models that we're used to in the field and taking them the next step and really beginning developing a language to become explicit about those relationships and, and to move away from what we refer to as list thinking. I think, you know, when you do, when you're used to doing focus groups, when you're used to doing surveys and all, you're used to creating lists. These are all the factors that affect social, de or these are all the social determinants. These are all the policies and environments. These are all the partners and, and all of that. And so you're used to that list thinking, but you're not used to thinking about how all of those pieces fit together. And so we've been actually um, learning how to develop questions and language to actually become more explicit about those relationships. So it's, it's been very exciting. I think we still have a long way to go before stocks and flows and all of that come naturally, but, but we, we are getting there and, and it's really exciting to see the, the staff skills and, and um, all of that develop so quickly. Um, and then in terms of the simulation modeling, I think um, I'm not sure if in my lifetime I'm going to be able to do what uh, Peter Havmond can do in terms of uh, building these simulation models, but working in close partnership and, and the more exposure that we've been getting, the more that we're learning about not only how do we develop these structures with the graphical models, but how do we actually look at the data and, and the relationships and, and build our methods for evaluation and, and building the evidence base in a way that complements what we're learning from this work. So um, I think that that's probably uh, a short and sweet kind of summary, but happy to answer any questions or thoughts you have. How about that? Good job. That Thank you. Happens. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> she, she ended exactly when the timer went off. So how about that? So now we have time for questions. I think our four speakers, maybe we should all collect on this side, maybe, um, and we'll have to just share this microphone. Um, do we have a microphone back there that we can use to run around to the crowds? No, we don't have any. <laughs> 
So um, I'm sorry about that. I guess I thought there would be one here. But um, so what's going to have to happen then is when we get a question, I, because it's being video cast, I need for the speaker who gets the question, to, or maybe I can restate it. You can stand up here, but you need to, right, that's fine, you can stand up here, but you need to have, they don't have a microphone to, to ask the questions from, unless you want me to run this one out. So um, make sure your question is loud, but the person up here will have to repeat it for the video cast. Okay, who had a question? Paul. Hi. Hi. Um, question, actually, uh, yeah, sure. So, so the question, so one question is about um, how do you actually begin to estimate some of the, the weights of these pluses and minuses? And then how do you, second part of that question is how do you compare these across uh, models? Is that well, across policies? Yeah. The second has to do with that, how Yeah. So, so let me start first with a qualification. So this was just, uh, uh, you know, the soda tax policy was an exercise. So it wasn't a, a comprehensive exercise of mapping all of the policies. So the fact that we have soda, as an example. Okay. So just, just so we're clear. So, so I think, um, let me talk. Maybe uh, this is a good question for Hashir and I to answer. Uh, I think together. But let me talk just about how I would think about doing that. I think the, the first part is these graphical models, we have to be clear in terms of their limitation, in terms of being able to draw predictions about what will happen. They, they are hypothesized system structure. And so that it's up there, and this actually didn't include industry representatives. This was from, from community members and how they're thinking about it. And it's still very much a work in progress. That is, the community pushed on that question and doing more modeling uh, might actually have uh, a much more elaborate view of how this would actually work and where it might benefit. And so if that's, that's, but it, even at that stage as a qualitative model, there are limitations in terms, terms of actually being able to predict what the effects might be. Um, the nature of these models is that you could have something like soda tax, for example, and, um, and, it, and it may or may not have any, it, it would, all of these variables in these, most of these variables in these models, or these, if you had a policy, they will tend to influence the trajectory somewhat. They'll be numerically sensitive. But will they actually change the curve from, for example, an increasing obesity epidemic to one that's declining? 
and there's actually generally going to be relatively few, and they may not be the ones that are most proximate to the issue. They, they may be in some other part of the system. So for an example, if we're just going with this example of the soda tax, it may be that um, there's a whole industry, and there are folks who are thinking about how do you model the industry and the markets and get market incentives lined up in a way, and I think Hashir has interests in, in that area in terms of thinking about not to put the whole problem uh, back on <laughs> sure. uh, but, but one of the things that we would actually think about it from a group model building point of view is actually bringing in sort of a wider group of folks to think about industry to, to, on, that, on that particular policy. But you sh I think we should always sort of be cautious of just assuming that this is, um, this is something where you, have, you can make those kinds of predictions. Um, you have to go to the quantitative model, and that's where the comparative weighting comes in. And so one of the it's not just a question of how you would weight this particular model. Uh, we might start, the way I was describing, we st it's a bootstrapping process. So you start with a very provisional weight. You say, if it has no effect, it's going to be 1. And if it has a 20% benefit, it would be 1.2, for example. Um, and then you start to think about what would it take to implement that? And what, what kinds of effects would you see in the rest of the system? Now, if it turns out when you do the sensitivity analysis and you go from 1.0 to 1.2 or to 1.5 and you find there are all kinds of sort of complex dynamics, there are tipping points where all of a sudden there's a bifurcation in the system and it does something different, that suggests now you need to go out and understand that much more carefully. And we can do that in this model. But I think from the policy point of view, you don't want to rely on just one model. You want to have, you want to have multiple models to look at and say, how did they assess the impact of a soda tax and what were not just the impact say on weight but what were the kinds of intended and unintended consequences uh, and Hashir was talking about worse before better what were some of those scenarios so some might not pick up on that and other models may and it's that, con it's that collection of results from multiple models that I think would give you a better idea of how to think about something like a, a, a soda tax. Um, and I think I think, uh, I, I think you covered most of the things that I would have okay. said. I, I, I just think of these as part of as, as a working progress. So this is an intermediate uh, artifact that has helped in the process of building it to create a relationship with the community, understand some of the factors that seem in that community to be of importance. So all these relationships are like thinking about the right hand side of a uh, regression equation. You have to decide what variables go there. We have decided on those through this process. That's one kind of result of this process. But then there are all other benefits in terms of uh, creating um, a kind of shared understanding in a group and so on. So that, that's kind of the social benefits that can help with the implementation of anything that comes out of this process. But if you want to do any serious policy analysis, then you need param reliable parameter estimates for a lot of these things. But again, we can go through the process that Peter explained to get to a model that uh, we ha still don't have reliable parameter estimates, but we can do sensitivity analysis to s decide what are those 10 to 20 percent of parameters that make the biggest impact, and therefore focus our data collection and literature review are on those rather than trying to tackle the whole big enchilada. And then out of those 10 to 20 percent of parameters, most likely you can find literature to cover half of them or more, depending on the context, sometimes less, sometimes more, that people already have answered or tried to answer those questions. So kind of uh, plugging those values into your model and then remains a few remaining parameters for which we don't have anything. And then you have to, to do the kind of calibration work that I was explaining in our setting. So this is really a step by step going through this whole process, trying to get from that big messy thing with lots of trees and so on to something that ta is tangible. And I think this is an artifact in that process, not necessarily an end state. So yeah, if anybody wants to do policy analysis with this, I don't think they can go that far. I mean, sometimes there is interesting insights from these qualitative models in terms of policy, but in most cases, I would be a little bit careful not to push that too much. So, so it's a goal that, you, that, that these models have to and in that, you know, that's what you Others there, the weighting becomes tighter and changes. 
the synergy in the group becomes possible. Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to add one comment from the community practice perspective. I think one of the important things to recognize here is that this is one community's perspective, you know, and and the energy in the room when we talked about soda tax policy was low and participation in the conversation was low. When the conversation shifted to revenue from soda tax, all of a sudden the energy in the room shifted and people were throwing out suggestions and, and, and all of that. And, and one of the things I meant to mention earlier is what we're hoping to do is actually use this work as a, a way to look at the 50 communities that were funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities. So we can take a complete streets policy, for example, and we can look at how it interacts in 10 different communities with some of these other factors. And so then we can actually begin to look at community variation too. So that's just another perspective on that piece as well. I think I understand. When that energy changes from that topic to that topic, what does that mean to you? A lot of things. Uh, I don't think that's a simple, um, simple piece. But I, I think what it meant, you know, what we heard um, from the community members is that, you know, they they live in a world where um, right now thinking about not drinking any soda isn't very practical for them. So, uh, or or for the kids in the community because that's what they see every day and that's what their experience is. So, I, I think that's the simple answer. We can talk more later. <laughs> Please. Just to push this one more step, um, thinking about the soda companies and this idea of the tax, the, and thinking of the simple versus the complex. The, there's been a lot of interest in the soda companies in doing very discrete studies, like if we take soda out of schools, will BMIs go down? And I don't think anybody thinks they would, but the soda company would like to see that study so that it would say, well, see. Um, you know, we took soda out and BMI didn't go down. And so that takes you away from this whole thing that it's way beyond just sodas in schools. It's, you know, how is that tied to snacks and the booster club thing or, you, you know. So I think that's a different way of looking at the complexity part of it. Okay, who else has a question? Yes, go ahead. So the, who, who wants to take the question? The question is, how do you present this in a way? And this is a challenge for us, and this is an important question because this is exactly what happens with the policymakers. You're not necessarily going to have folks or uh, folks in the community who are going to be able to tolerate a mathematically complex um, model. So, who would like to tackle Peter? Um, well, I think I think the in terms of the mathematical complexity, in terms of the actual formulation of equations. I think that's something where you start to run into to some of these barriers. But, you know, and, and as an example, with these kinds of diagrams, if the, the one of the arguments for doing group mob building is you're building this up with the participants as you go. And, and uh, we've had a number of experiences, for example, where you're staying, if, if you're listening to the stories and you draw the diagram and you read the diagram back, uh, it's their community. They very quickly grasp what the grammar is of these diagrams, um, and and it's and we've done we've seen that happen pretty consistently uh, in very marginalized communities. You, uh, so we haven't seen an issue like that with the West End. And in fact, we actually had some examples where uh, some of the community members actually gave us a, a, had some pushback on the model, and we assumed incorrectly that they just didn't understand the math that might go behind it. And in fact, they understood it well enough to understand that it was incorrect. Uh, and, and so I think at that level to, to where you get to, to specification, not the, there's a certain point where it gets to be, and, and people aren't interested in actual, d d some of the details. Um, I think likewise, if you are involved with building the models with policymakers, it becomes a bit, bit easier. 
But diagrams like this, if you just presented it to a new audience, is, is often pretty overwhelming. Um, and so there is that communication challenge in terms of people who weren't involved in the model building. How do you present that? And just, just to add on that point, what we usually we find to be useful is to kind of layer it. So as Peter did, to start with a very simple chunk so that people learn the vocabulary and then from there go next to the uh, adding one piece and one piece. And uh, that way most audiences have had a experience presenting to get the basic idea fairly quickly. In fact, sometimes it is dangerous because people get too excited because they think they understand the thing too much beyond what they actually really do because then the question of what the quantitative results of these interactions are gets kind of passed by and they, they think their mental models can uh, actually tell what the final result is. So we should be careful in that case to contain the excitement more than worry about That's an important point. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, what would you like to? The question is, how do you uh, avoid perpetuating misinformation when you're gathering it from a community that might be misinformed, non-experts? Everyone is misinformed. So, so that, that, that's a good, if you just have a group model building exercise, what you're aggregating initially are people's misinformation about the system. And, and we certainly saw initially when we started this process, we had uh, folks would say things like, well, it's just parents, parents don't know how to cook very, you know, very, there was a set of issues that really underestimated some of the pieces that came out of the model building and understanding some of the parents' issues. But then you get to this point, so this is more of a systems view, but it still has a lot of potential um, import of myths and misunderstandings of the community. So um, there, there, there's one strategy that at least is my preference for how you handle that. You, the, ish, the example you gave in terms of pharmaceuticals, we had a common literature. You had a common referent and way of evaluating that model. You had a way of going back to the literature and to data to improve the model. Uh, likewise, if we keep the referent consistent, meaning we're talking about the same community, we're not talking about some arbitrary community in the United States, but people live and work in that community, the referent is unambiguous. Um, and then you can build up where people don't know what, what's working or how it's working you can go out and collect data, and the community-driven process, people will actually motivate that. So we were talking earlier about things like the subsidies for, um, you know, it was the subsidies for food and the, so, you know, would, would, more, would making soda more expensive have an impact? Uh, is, it, is it really cost of the healthy food that's prohibiting people? So these were questions uh, from buying healthier food, like the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables. These are questions that are discussed in the literature, but they were actually also coming up in the community modeling group and, and, and it's uh, things we would keep a list of. But then you can go and you can collect data on that. If that's, if that's the thing that turns out to be pretty important and it's clear what you collect data on, you collect data from that particular community. So what you're substituting, the difference here is instead of just having the literature as being the referent for how you're resolving those kinds of questions, here the common referent is the community. Uh, and then the other part is if you, when you have, there's other, another point to this which is when you have misinformation in play, you have two options. One is you have the right answer and then you go and you tell people, I have the right answer and this is what you need to do. But part of the problem here is that that doesn't work uh, in this community. It doesn't work, in, it may not work in any community, but, but there are actually a lot of reasons why it wouldn't work in this community. And so you're in a much better position is the argument by working through those myths and unpacking them. And, and there's nothing that says in this process that we can't bring in scientific literature. So, so Laura, for example, will raise a question, well, you know, 
um, some of the research shows this, this, and this. I'm wondering if that's happening. We'll challenge some of these things as we're developing it. But then you're bringing up, now what you're doing is you're constructing, uh, in particular in the core modeling group, a, a group of people who understand the complexity of the system, who are being, also understand more what the research is saying, and also understand the data that's coming from the community. So it's a, you could think about it as a process of triangulation. And they are going to be, the argument is, in a much better position to actually communicate that mis, you know, sort of understand and challenge those myths within the community to implement change. Um, so that's the, part of the reason for doing this is you're actually hopefully um, challenging the myths as you go along and developing through essentially a scientific process a way that people are thinking much more critically about this uh, and then able to share those with their neighbors and kids and, and family members and so forth. So, but you're absolutely right. You shouldn't you know, just do a session, walk away from it, and assume that's, that's truth in the same way that you know, if you've been studying it uh, rigorously through scientific methods for a longer time. Adding one thing, I, I, I think we, we, we should really look at these as hypotheses. That, that's one thing. So no matter what the source are, these are not the real causal connections. These are just things that we think of as potentially relevant to the problem. And then you may later on, when you try to quantify some of these relationships, figure out that they, are, they don't have the impact or even have the others, the sign is not positive, it's negative. But then within that broader hypothesis perspective, uh, we can't ask every question from every person. So people are have real knowledge about things that are more tangible to them, their day-to-day -day activities, personal decisions. So for those social factors and behavioral factors, uh, this is a good way of gathering the information. For some other questions, we just group model building with this audience would it be the best way to gather uh, that type of information. And even there, when the, inform the, the group knows something about that uh, context, uh, we still have to really push them for mechanisms. So the idea is to go into details and unpack the beliefs about the general relationship between X and Y and say, why does X influence Y? And try to c capture the intermediate variables that at least they hypothesize to be part of that causal pathway. So that way, the thinking about it becomes more clear. But at the end of the day, this is just a qualitative uh, set of hypotheses. It doesn't go that much further from that. So I think that your point is very much valid. Who's next? Oh. Two minutes. One more. One more question. Yes, David. That, that's all we have time for, so that's a very good comment. Thank you, David, for sharing. If any of you would like to follow up on any of these uh, things, we, we're all moving to the uh, the speakers, and I will be headed to the Marriott Hotel, which is right up on the hill, the Marriott Bethesda North Conference Center and Hotel. So if you'd like to come up there, we'll be in the On the Rocks uh, bar, and it's cash bar, so bring your cash. And thank you for attending. <laughs>